Hello, Buglers, and welcome to issue 4195 of The Bugle, audio newspaper for a tired, tetchy, troubled, turbulent, but still to visual world, the five T's, with me, Andy Zaltzman. I am here in London, the UK, and this week's podcast comes with a free bonus extra millisecond, which, if you play it backwards, slowed down 100,000 times, contains the secret to eternal life and happiness. We can't tell you which millisecond it is, and it is embargoed and password locked until the year 3021 for public safety and global economic purposes. Apologies for that, but do please keep this episode safe for your descendants. Uh, We are recording on the 24th of May. Uh, Obviously, that's the 32nd birthday of my former dog, Emeril. I can't believe she's gone. Uh, Also, on this day in 1626, Peter Minuit bought Manhattan. The uh, Dutch Chancellor bought the uh, renowned island for a box of random shit worth about 25 bucks, according to legend. Uh, Now the price of the average Manhattan sandwich. Uh, Although I think it's fair to say that uh, Manhattan has changed somewhat over the past 395 years. In those days, for example, the city did in fact often sleep. And although the metro system wasn't up to much and there weren't so many Major League Baseball teams, it was less polluted and better for dog walking. So all in all, uh, ups and downs. Uh, NATO, you are our uh, Middle East uh, Ructions uh, correspondent, um, being as you are one of uh, God's chosen people, uh, like my good self. Um, uh, just, uh, just bring us up to date with the, uh, with the latest, and whether in fact God has come out of retirement to clarify any of the uh, uh, squabbles uh, about, the, uh, about the land. Uh, Andy, you're not kidding about how easy it is to offend everyone on all sides. Um, I spent, uh, a lot of people spent the 11 days of of violence in uh, Palestine sort of feverishly watching the news. I spent 11 days trying to decide if I should play a game and get myself immediately canceled by the entire political spectrum simply by (laughs) tweeting Zionists are (laughs) Uh, So, which would have done the trick. Um, So... Uh, I did not. Um, All right, congratulations. Well done. Thank you. I, I <laughs> exercise holding that to get this entire podcast cancelled instead by retelling yeah, that. Story. That's right. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the uh, the news media quaintly calls it a conflict in which extremists on quote both sides are responsible for violence, and it is a conflict with both sides in the same sense that I had a conflict with my snooze button for 40 minutes after the, after the alarm went off. Uh, <laughs> one side controlled the result and electricity itself, and the other side could at most make a vaguely annoying sound for every eight minutes. So uh, those are the sort of the sides. At, uh, and like as a Jew, it's, it's hard to, because whenever Israel does something shitty, people want me to have an opinion about it. Uh, I can tolerate a, ba- a basic level of answering for annoying shit Jews do like every Adam Sandler movie, but this is dog shit. Uh, kick them out of the tribe. Give them their foreskins back. These motherfuckers make me look bad. Uh, and you know, I guess you know both sides, as, as NATO was saying, both sides have uh, have been do, doing bad things. I guess this is like you know, you have the Grand National Horse Race where you know, you've got two trainers cheating. One is cheating by giving it steroids, and the other is using a supersonic jet fighter uh, in a pantomime horse's outfit and wins the race at a record fifteen point three seconds. Both are wrong, but one definitely has a strategic advantage in terms of. In terms of hardware, and and looking at the, the history of it, and uh, uh, maybe you can shed some light on this. Anna, but a lot of it, you know, goes goes back to the sort of early twentieth century, and uh, the British carve up of the region. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, Britain learned from from any mistakes that were made uh, in that, and future carve ups of region <laughs> went absolutely seamlessly for the rest of that century. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I can't think of any other countries that Britain divided up in the nineteen forties. Um, it was a very quiet time when it came to borders in Britain. Um, but, you know, one thing that's been interesting to me a lot, uh, NATO, uh, Andy, maybe you guys know something about this, has been this uh, iron dome that Israel has. And it's been all over the papers, uh, some sort of a shield to cover an entire country. And I was trying to look at the map of West Bank, and I guess it's a good thing or a bad thing. I live in a very large country, and I figured what it would look like if, if you know, the size of West Bank... Uh, a sort of similar violent protest broke out in India. And I realized that the place is so close that I'd have to fight with my local biryani shop, which is four streets away. <laughs> uh, that's how tight it seemed like the place was. Now, this Iron Dome thing, I just want to know a little more about it because I've been living with my parents now for about a week and I feel like I need one around me. So is there... Well, this is turning into a isn't the world f- up section. And uh, let's move to another despotic government, Belarus. 
uh, and its suspiciously mustachioed uh, leader, uh, Lukashenko, has, has made a play for uh, a bit more international scrutiny of its, uh, frankly, abhorrent leadership by hijacking a Ryanair flight. Um, now, it wasn't just your, your average common or garden uh, hijacking. It was a, a gambit that, were it not so politically motivated with such worrying implications, would be regarded as just a bit of a prank, fake bomb threat to this Ryanair flight, causing a, a plane that was en route between Athens uh, in Greece and Vilnius in Lithuania to make an emergency landing in the Belarusian capital Minsk, then cheekily arresting the 26-year-old journalist Roman Protasevich, an activist and writer who is not always 100% complimentary towards uh, Mr. Uh, Lukas. Shenko. Yeah, I mean, look, if this became standard, which is, you know, hijacking commercial planes and turning them around, I mean, I've fled many cities after dubious gigs. Andy, <laughs> and if this became standard, they'll make the plane turn around and make me face my audience for my sins. <laughs> I have to return to whatever city I've fled. It's dangerous. Also, I don't know, uh, Andy Nato, if I told you guys this, but um, Air France last year uh, had a small incident. An Indian guy got drunk on an Air France flight coming from Paris to Mumbai and shout, started shouting praises for Prime Minister Modi. Uh, so the pilot just dropped off this drunk man in Bulgaria. He just landed the plane. Oh, he landed the plane, didn't just like drop him off. Out, out <laughs> that's coming up. Right. I think that's okay. next, Andy. I think that, that is Ryanair's next plan. But well, Air France was kind enough to, to land the plane in Sofia, throw this man out, give him a translator, and uh, they put him in jail and the plane took off. So I think that's another approach that if, if they don't like your behavior, they could just leave you in any country. Uh, Lukashenko has been described as Europe's last dictator, uh, a tag that is looking increasingly like hopeless optimism. And the European, <laughs> Union is, well, the European Union is not happy. It was a flight between two of its member states on an airline that is based in another of its member states. Uh, and it was hijacked and taken to, to another country. So I think if the EU is not happy, I think this means in Brexit Britain, we have to support Lukashenko and Belarus and say that this is, this is absolutely, absolutely fine. And uh, this 26 year old uh, dissident journalist, Protasevich, was probably asked, he probably hadn't, you know, he was on a Ryanair flight. It's quite possible that he simply had not paid the 29 euros 99 surcharge not to be kidnapped by the Belarusian regime. And <laughs> You know, that he could have still paid it in flight at the higher cost of 59.99, but the card reader wasn't working. So there was nothing they could do to stop him being pilfered uh, in, into custody. Uh, apparently there were other passengers who complained that they paid extra for speedy deboarding, but had to wait until Protasevich had been uh, spirited away uh, into the depths of the uh, um, Belarusian prison system before they were allowed off the aircraft. They have been offered now a, a partial refund. India news now. And, well, Anuvab, uh, as you mentioned, things are not um, completely uh, fine in... Uh, mm in India uh, right now. Uh, the Indian government, however, has uh, started to get things back under control by just trying to stop people saying that uh, it's not under control. Uh, uh, an example of this has been that um, social media platforms have been ordered to take down content that, that refers to the Indian variant of the uh, the coronavirus. Um, and I mean, how, how successful is this uh, is this being? But, you know, if you just stop people from mentioning it, does that make it go away? Well, yeah, you know, it's a good strategy. You know, it's tautology. True, false false, false, true, you know, and you can build a mathematical model around it. So what's happened here is that the Indian government is dealing with two variants, which are known as the Indian variants, the B1617.1 and the B1617.2. They were first detected in India last year and has been blamed for killing loads and loads of other Indians, as well as it spread to Britain and 43 other countries. However, the government uh, put out a statement that said, uh, it has come to our knowledge that a false statement is being circulated online, which implies that an Indian variant of the coronavirus is spreading across countries. This is completely false. And this is a letter they sent to the Argence France press. Now, if you put out a statement that says false, even though something is true in capital letters, <laughs> then obviously we all know it is false. And I agree with the minister. You see, by naming something, something else, we all know it becomes something else. Everyone knows that the Indian variant originated in India, right? It's killed 3 million people here. It's a slightly difficult secret to keep. However, if you call it something else more nonsensical, like the Fandango variant, for example, <laughs> then automatically what is true is false. Basic tautology, Andy Nato. And I think they're taking the lead from Shakespeare's Macbeth. There is a long-standing curse on various stages around the world that saying Macbeth 
is a bad thing. It'll ruin the play. It might even ruin your life. So they call it the Scottish play. So here, by naming the Indian variant Fandango, India has nothing to do, and the virus can continue doing its job, being an Indian variant, infecting Indians and others. All right. Well, I hadn't looked at it from that, that perspective before. I mean, obviously, we've had the, the British variant, uh, mm -hmm. and we were quite proud that it was a British variant. We, we proudly sent it off into the world to cause merry <laughs> havoc, and now we don't want other variants coming back into Britain, winning Britain a special award for most obviously metaphorical national COVID response. So that's, uh, that's been quite exciting. Um, quite, but I mean, for, for Modi, it's, uh, it's kind of classic, but if, if I close my eyes, you can't see me um, type of government. Yes. That's been surprisingly effective. Through. I mean, he's essentially trying to sweep the still twitching injured crocodile under the carpet. Uh, of, uh, which, that kind of strategy for tidying your living room, which is not always a long-term winner, even if you do enjoy having a wriggly carpet massaging your tired feet for a while as you chill on the sofa before the uh, angry, reawakening crocodile bites your legs off and then shits on your carpet for, for vengeance phase uh, of things. So I okay, guess so we'll just... Yeah. Okay, we don't know how it's going to pan out. In other animal news now, uh, well, this goes to the, the United States, uh, NATO, in um, Americans being told not to get off with chickens news um the the uh, the cdc has urged uh, america not to smooch its chickens um i mean do, do americans spend a lot of time kissing chickens and if so uh why don't kink shame me zaltzman <laughs> <laughs> don't knock until you try it do you know <laughs> Uh, it's it's a way of uh, it's it's not just chickens but it's other poultry as well and I don't know if you realize how much kissing chickens and other poultry improves the taste um, well, like you know how how delicious foie gras is when the duck yeah. is restrained and force fed acorns now right. imagine how much better that would be if the duck got to make out a little first right hmm. um, so uh, but the, the infections, the CDC reported that the infections were linked to backyard poultry. And so the, clearly the recommendation coming out of it is to bring the poultry in the house. Uh, <laughs> and just douse them with hand sanitizer, Purell, and then, and then you're good to go. Get back, right. you know, get back to your, 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 your kissing tongue. Kissing your chickens. Your kissing chickens. Yeah, but but can, can, can we not preach abstinence here, NATO? Can America in these difficult times not be, you know, just... Just you know, hold it in. You know, take your chicken out for a no strings dinner. Make it clear it's not going to lead to anything physical. Just just let it build up more mm. gradually until the salmonella scare. I mean, it's just yeah, everyone's so just so desperate to get down to it with their chickens that you're not prepared to wait like in the old days. I don't know if you realize how sexy American chickens are, Andy. Uh, to be fair, no, I don't. No, no. They're, it's it's a whole different level of sexiness than right. the kind of the kind of ugly weak chin chickens that you have right. in the uk right <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you're body shaming our chickens now <laughs> i mean here we, there's a you know, fairy the famous fairy story that if you kiss a frog it might turn into a prince um which uh, has been around in this country for, i believe to date back to uh the future uh george the fourth having a skin infection and an enlarged thyroid after a particularly hard year on the booze um but uh, in america I mean, is it, is it, do people think, oh, if I kiss a chicken, it might become, you know, you know a president uh, or, you know, a, a vote or you know, a, a double down the renowned chicken sandwich stroke one dish culinary crime spree? Is that, is that what people are going for when they kiss their chickens? Uh, there's, an Amer there's an old American myth that if you, if you kiss a chicken, it'll, it'll turn into a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Man, there's, there's a lot of people kissing chickens in America. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, you, you, it, it, we get our favorite things that way. <laughs> All your dreams come true. The uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer here, Jonathan Van Tam, said a really extraordinary thing about, about travel and whether or not you should go. He said, everything is relative. And the other bit of relativity is whether you're, when you go abroad, jumping into a pond with one shark in it or jumping into a pond with 100 sharks in it, it changes the likelihood that you're going to get bitten. Now, <laughs> there is, I mean, for a start... <laughs> this is a, a senior public official in the middle of a pandemic, and it does suggest he has not been getting a lot of sleep in the last 15 months. <laughs> but also, for start, I mean, if you're looking at a pond and, and it has any sharks in it, you're not going to get in the f***ing pond. It, it's not like, I mean, it's more like making a choice 
between jumping into a pond that has between zero and one sharks in it. You know, anything <laughs> below half a shark, you might take your chances. Whether whether it's you know relaxing to splash about in a pool with the remnants of a dismembered shark in it, I don't know. But but a hundred besides a hundred sharks in a pond, I mean that logistically, it's going to be hard for those sharks to actually move, let alone bite you as they writhe around in the throes of a, a, like a bizarre animal rights abuse death. A, a, a shark with a hundred ponds in it. It's, that is not a valid comparison for a holiday scenario. That is a Netflix documentary waiting to happen. Yeah. And this gentleman's view of relativism just seems to be like you'll be relatively dead or absolutely dead. <laughs> <laughs> also, I mean, sharks, they don't live in ponds generally, do they? I don't know if he's mixing up sharks with tadpoles. <laughs> and a shark in a pond is more likely to say, please help, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what is he doing in the pond exactly? Although I have to say, Andy Dato, I went to Dubai once and they had a shark in a mall. <laughs> was it at the Mall of Emirates? Yeah, they had a massive aquarium, and and there was a shark staring at a Gucci store. It was very disconcerting for the shark. What, was it the general manager? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I saw an ice hockey game in a shopping mall in Dubai. Just walking around the corner, uh, I heard the sound of sport. Naturally, I was uh, magnetically uh, attracted to to follow that noise. And there was a, a professional ice hockey match. Two teams of uh, it's be exclusively Russian ice hockey players playing in front of some confused Emirati shoppers. And I figured that maybe uh, the world needs to reassess its priorities. In the middle of the Arabian desert. 